fact, in uh, San Nicolas, Argentina in 1989, she said, Today my visits are renewed on earth. They are more frequent and more prolonged because humanity is passing through drastic times. Beginning with that Fatima apparition a hundred years ago and continuing to our very day, Jesus and the Blessed Mother have revealed to numerous visionaries throughout the world a warning of an upcoming chastisement. In Akita, Japan, on August 3, 1973, our Blessed Mother said, The Heavenly Father is preparing to inflict a chastisement on all mankind. With my son, I have intervened so many times to appease the wrath of the Father. I have prevented the coming of calamities by offering him the sufferings of the Son on the cross, his precious blood, and beloved souls who console him. Prayer, penance, and courageous sacrifices can soften the Father's anger, she said. So clearly, Mary and the three prophets that I mentioned took a look at the times in which you and I are living, and they believed we are in the midst of one of history's greatest confrontations between good and evil, possibly the final confrontation. They believed that the storm clouds are gathering that God's judgment and chastisement is near. Pope Leo XIII understood this very clearly. He received a vision of what was to be the coming 20th century, a vision that I believe history has proven terrifyingly true. He saw Satan at the beginning of time allowed one century to do his worst work, and Satan chose the 20th. This so terrified Pope Leo that he composed the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel, a prayer for the church to use throughout the entirety of the 20th century of spiritual warfare that he foresaw. This prayer was known by every Catholic and prayed after every Mass until around the 1960s when it ceased to be part of our regular practice. In the 50 years that have ensued, I would submit that we have seen the rapid ruin of our society. Let us pray right now for the intercession of St. Michael as we begin this conference tonight. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all evil spirits who wander about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. The truth is, we are in the midst of a spiritual war. We are under attack. But the truth is we have been under attack from the beginning, when Satan first tempted and deceived our parents. So how does he tempt us? What makes him so good at what he does? Well, he tempts us with the same weapons that he has used since the foundation of the world, the same weapons that he used to tempt Jesus in the desert, the desire for pleasure, for power, for possessions. He tempted Jesus to decide for himself how to satisfy the hunger that was in his soul. He tempted Jesus to assume power for himself and not be patient and trusting in God's plan for his life. He tempted Christ to trade his sonship for all the material blessings that the world has to offer. We have a clear choice. 
We can either accept or reject God's will in this time of spiritual and moral ruin. To me, it is clear that we are standing at a crossroads, and God is warning us of impending judgment. So when will this happen? Well, this is the same question that the apostles asked Jesus right after he told them of the coming destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Christ outlined for them seven signs, seven things that must occur before God's chastisement would arrive. These seven signs are the same signs that we are to watch for whenever we want to discern whether God's chastisement might be near again. So let's read those seven signs out of chapter 24 of Matthew's Gospel. Jesus says, See that no one deceives you, for many will come. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah and they will deceive many. The first sign, the rise of antichrists or false messiahs. You will hear of wars and reports of war. See that you are not alarmed, for these things must happen, but it will not yet be the end. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Political upheaval, wars and reports of wars, the second sign. There will be famines and earthquakes from place to place. All these things are the beginning of the labor pains, severe natural and man-made disasters, the third sign. They will hand you over to persecution and they will kill you. You will be hated by all nations because of my name. The fourth sign, persecution of the church. And then many will be led into sin. They will betray and hate one another. Many prophets will arise and deceive many. A great abandonment of the Christian faith, the fifth sign. The love, there will be a great increase in evil doing, and the love of many will grow cold. The sixth sign, a lowering of societal norms and morals. And finally, but the one who perseveres to the end will be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. The seventh sign, the preaching of the gospel to the entire world. So let's look at each of these seven signs briefly and see how they pointed to the chastisement that came upon first century Israel, but how they might be sending a message to you and I again today. The rise of antichrists are false prophets, false messiahs. During the Jewish Roman, <clears throat> Roman War in AD 67, there appeared several false messiahs in Judea. Their message was always the same. Join me and God will enable us to overthrow the Roman Empire. Jesus knew that many Jews would follow these false prophets who promised to change the course of history, but Jesus wanted his followers to know that the God of Israel is in charge of the course of history, and no man has the power to alter that. You know, an antichrist is simply a false prophet someone who seduces the masses with lies. Now, I don't know who we might identify in our day and age as a false messiah, but I think we can clearly see the seduction of the masses through lies played out in front of our eyes every day. The three enemies of our soul are the world and its call to materialism, the flesh, and it's called to gratify our passions and our pleasures, and Satan and his call to disobedience. Pride, power, possessions, and pleasure, the same things that have brought mankind down from the beginning. The sad thing is, 
the most powerful teacher of these lies, is often given free reign in our homes and in our lives. I often wonder to myself if it is the Antichrist of which Scripture speaks. I call it the signal, the television signal, the radio signal, the internet signal, the iPhone signal. The signal is in our cars, it is in virtually every room of our homes, it is in the palm of our hand. It is right there in full color, high definition, megapixels, and surround sound. It is everywhere we go and it is in operation 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And what is the predominant message of the signal? Sexuality is all about pleasure and entertainment. Everything you want and dream of is just a good credit score away. It is your life. You are in charge. Just do it. One of Verizon's recent ad campaigns was, it's your world. Your signal puts you in control. It is your time to rule the air. It is your world. You are in control. It is your time to rule. Does that sound like a message from God? Or does that sound like the very message that Satan tried to deceive Jesus with in the desert 2,000 years ago? The message has not changed. The method of delivery is all that has changed. The question we must ask ourselves, of course, is not is the signal the Antichrist, but whose values and beliefs are we listening to? Whose values and beliefs are we allowing to be taught in our homes? Those of God or those of Satan and the culture that he has created? The message of disobedience, materialism, and lust is a lie, and it is being told over and over and over again in the very heart of our homes. I like to use my father as an example here, because this much I know about the man who raised me. If what is on the television today would have been on the television then, he would have taken it into the street and busted it with a sledgehammer rather than let his family be exposed to that garbage. And yet today, he has a 54-inch high-definition flat screen in his living room for his grandchildren to enjoy. The signal slowly and relentlessly encourages us to accept the ways of our culture, the wisdom of our age. It convinces us that the path to fulfillment and happiness is through possessions and activities, through self-gratifying sexuality, through following your own will, not through a meaningful relationship with God. In Quito, Ecuador, and Milan, Italy, the Blessed Mother said, a campaign against the virtues of chastity and purity will succeed in corrupting the youth. They will come to justify and exalt impure acts against nature, even to the point of putting homosexual cohabitation on par with marriage. Is the signal the Antichrist that God warns about? I don't know. But I know that many of those who make use of the power of this signal could surely be described as false prophets 
intent on leading God's people astray. The second sign, political upheaval, wars and reports of wars. The decade of the 60s in Rome, not unlike the same decade in our own country, saw society begin to disintegrate. The Roman imposed peace that had ruled the ancient world began to deteriorate. Some political observers of the first century believed that the Roman Empire would not survive the political turmoil that had engulfed it. The decade began with rebellion in Britain, ended with the Jewish-Roman War in Judea, and in between the Emperor Nero committed suicide and civil war erupted within the walls of Rome. Three generals fought for the right to be the next Caesar, and by the time Vespian emerged in A.D. 69, the infighting had devastated the empire. Now, I'm not sure how the election process in our nation over the last few decades could be described as anything but political turmoil. The American people are fed up with the ruling elites who are out of touch with the people they have been elected to serve. They believe they are above the law. And the campaign rhetoric has devolved into personal attacks and name-calling. As to wars and reports of wars, when we take a look at American history over the last 150 years, we see a very interesting trend. Beginning in 1860 and going through 1910, the only time we were not at peace was the six years of the Civil War. So for that 50-year period, we enjoyed 44 years of peace. In the next 50-year period, 1910 to 1960, we found ourselves in World War I, World War II, and the Korean War. A total of 16 years of war and only 34 years of peace. In the final 50-year period from 1960 to 2010, We've been involved in Vietnam, the Persian Gulf, Afghanistan, and Iraq. 31 years of war and only 19 years of peace. We have basically gone from 45 years of peace to 35 years of peace to 20 years of peace. And if the trend continues, we may never know peace again, a time unstained by war. So to say that in our time there have been wars and rumors of wars would clearly be an understatement. The Blessed Mother has continually warned us that a third world war approaches. In Ecuador, the Philippines, Ukraine, and Spain, Mary has said, there will come a great chastisement for all mankind. A chastisement the likes of which has never been seen. A great war will come. The whole world will face ruin. The third sign, severe natural disasters. In the mid to late 40s, Judea was visited with a great famine. It explains why Paul was regularly collecting donations from the Gentile Christians to ease the suffering of the church in Judea. But that famine was nothing compared to what descended on Jerusalem during the war Roman siege in the late 60s. The historian Josephus describes it like this. Those that perished in the city due to famine was prodigious, and the miseries they underwent was unspeakable. Their hunger was so intolerable that the very leather from their shields they pulled off and gnawed on. During this time in the ancient world, there were two earthquakes of incredible magnitude. The city of Colossae was totally destroyed during the 50s, and Pompeii was devastated in A.D. 63 and eventually buried under volcanic ash. Earthquakes 
hurricanes, forest fires, tornadoes, ice storms, drought, flooding, meteors, asteroids. Is it just my imagination? Or do these things seem to be happening at alarming rates? Just here in the Midwest, in the last 20 years, we've had two 500-year floods. The fact is that documented natural disasters worldwide have grown from 50 occurrences per year in the 1950s to nearly 400 occurrences per year in our current day. Now we can blame all of this on global warming, or we can accept the fact that it is but a reflection of the moral health of our world and a sign of chastisement on the horizon. One third of all natural disasters in the 20th century happened in the 1990s, the final decade. And since the turn of the century, things have only intensified. When speaking of wars and natural disasters, Christ describes them, as we heard, as the beginning of the labor pains. As we can see, the increase with which these natural disasters are occurring and the intensity which with which they are striking, combined with the virtual constant state of war that we find ourselves in, it is clear that the labor pains, as Christ described them, are increasing in both frequency and intensity. And as every mother can tell you, when the labor pains increase in frequency and intensity, it means only one thing. The time has arrived. The chastisement is near. The fourth sign, persecution of the church. This sign involves hatred for and even death to the followers of Christ. This persecution of the early Christian community was first driven by the Jewish leaders. Remember the stoning of Stephen. What was the accusation against Stephen? That he said Jesus was going to destroy the temple. Or better stated, he warned that Jesus of Nazareth would destroy the temple. And then Saul of Tarsus, of course, was dragging Christians out of their homes and turning them over to the authorities to be imprisoned. But in AD 64, Nero blamed the fire that burned nearly two-thirds of Rome to the ground on the Christians. And the Roman Empire got involved in hunting them down. When we try to imagine how Cardinal George's successor could end up in jail, it is really not that hard to imagine a scenario. How long will it be before an archbishop is jailed for refusing to allow Catholic charities in his diocese to place adoptive children with gay couples? Or refusing to allow Catholic priests in his diocese to perform gay marriages? Or refusing to allow Catholic schools in his diocese to implement the Common Core standards, or refusing to permit Catholic hospitals in his diocese to perform abortions. It is really that black and white. There are those in power who desire that the secular government reach into every part of our lives and in the process subvert the religious freedom on which this nation was founded. Why? Well, because if the church can be silenced, there will be very little opposition to any law or policy they wish to enact, no matter how unjust or immoral. The persecution of the church in America began gradually, but it has accelerated quickly. It began as all persecution begins by attaching stereotypes to the persecuted. For many in power in our culture, people of faith are the inhibitors of progress. 
and they deserve to be caricaturized as Bible thumpers, and therefore ignorant and unenlightened. As the secular state grows, it justifies criticism of Christians who refuse to embrace its agenda. Christians who oppose the fundamental transformation that the government desires are described as close-minded, harmful to freedom, intolerant, hateful, bigoted, unfair, and homophobic, just to name a few of the labels that we have been given. The next step in persecution involves marginalizing Christians. Christianity is seen by the secular government as harmful to society at large, so its immense contribution over the centuries is either downplayed or downright denied. In practice, the secular government's hatred of religion means that public prayer must be forbidden, as it is in our schools. The Christian influence on public policy must be eliminated, as it was in the issue of gay marriage. And that Christian holidays must be secularized. Think of Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. The next step of the persecution involves criminalizing Christians and their churches, businesses, and educational institutions. Here's the truth. An exponentially increasing amount of litigation is currently being directed against the church and other Christians for daring to live their faith. And it signals the beginning of the steady erosion of religious liberty in our country. The next logical step involves persecuting Christians outright. As I said, it may involve the current fight to force institutions and businesses to adhere to government health care mandates, such as providing abortion and contraceptive services. But it could well accelerate to Henry VIII-style seizure of church property and monies because Christian leaders refuse to bow to the doctrines of the secular state. Even jail time for Christians is quite possible. Already in Canada and parts of Europe, Catholic clergy have been arrested and charged with hate crimes for preaching the church's stance on homosexual behavior. The only stage of persecution that remains is the death of Christians who are not willing to abandon their faith. So can you see now how Cardinal George envisioned what he believed might happen to his successor and to his successor. Worldwide, of course, the rise of Islamic extremism, persecution of Christians is reaching unprecedented levels. Open Doors USA, a group that is dedicated to helping Christians facing persecution, has said that last year will go down in history as having the highest level of global persecution of Christians in the modern era. And conditions suggest to them it is only going to get worse. So the fifth sign, a mass apostasy or abandonment of the faith. During the Great Tribulation, as Rome fought to end the church's very existence, it was abetted by turncoat Christians who hated and betrayed Christ's faithful followers, just as Jesus said they would. Brothers delivered up their own brothers to, the de to death at the hands of the Romans, fathers against their children, and children against their parents. Quite naturally, when intense tribulation comes upon the church, when lies are being told in society, and everyone is living as if there is no God, Widespread apostasy or falling away from the faith will soon follow. The false messiahs, sadly, are often Christians within the church teaching and preaching heresy. You know, one of the hallmarks of a Catholic is to believe and profess all that the Catholic Church believes and teaches. Converts, like my wife, must specifically and publicly profess that they do. Cradle Catholics, like me, on the other hand, never have to make 
that public profession. And it becomes all too easy, I think, for us to fall into the hypocrisy of believing only what is convenient and comfortable. It is for my generation of Catholics that the term cafeteria Catholic was coined. It is in this picking and choosing of which doctrines and which beliefs we will follow and which we will not that I believe has caused us the inability to hand the faith on to the next generation. In St. Paul's second letter to Timothy, we read what we can expect as chastisement nears. It says, understand this. There will be terrible times. People will be self-centered and lovers of money. Proud, boastful, abusive, disobedient to their parents. Ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, without self-control, conceited. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. It sounds to me as if St. Paul is describing the very culture that we live in. The sixth sign, a lowering of societal norms and morals. In Rome, luxury and indulgence were commonplace. Children were considered a burden, and allowing them to die, exposing them to death, was legal. Marriage was ever decreasing in the empire, and homosexual behavior was common and accepted. The people were self-indulgent, had a mindset of entitlement, and a significant portion of the populace was supported at government cost. Does that sound familiar? I don't think it is much of a stretch to say that modern-day America in many ways mirrors ancient Rome. The family is once again in peril. Divorce has become widely accepted and even encouraged. Nearly 60 million American children have been put to death in the last 40 years through the evil of abortion. The Blessed Mother said in Nigeria in 1998, the blood of innocent children has filled heaven. Their blood disturbs my agonizing heart. The wrath of the Father is about to fall on mankind. Homosexuality has become normalized and legalized. Addictions to drugs, alcohol, gambling, and pornography are at epidemic levels. A larger and larger portion of our populace has developed a sense of entitlement and is supported at government cost. An ever-increasing portion of our elderly are being removed from the mainstream of family life and shuttled off to assisted care facilities and nursing homes. Choices which were once unanimously considered immoral in our society are gradually becoming socially acceptable. This widespread conditioning is darkening our conscience, and we are finding it increasingly more difficult to distinguish between good and evil. But God says, woe to those who call evil good. But that is exactly what we have done. We've exploited the poor, we call it the lottery. We've rewarded laziness. We call it welfare. We've killed our unborn children. We've called it choice. We've neglected to discipline our children, and we've called it building self-esteem. We've polluted the air with pornography and profanity, and we've called it freedom of expression. The lowering of societal norms and morals seems to know no bounds. And as with the increase in wars and political upheaval, the increase in natural disasters, this headlong descent deeper and deeper into immorality once again indicates that the labor pains are increasing in both intensity and frequency. 
as we hasten toward the chastisement that is on the horizon. The seventh sign, the preaching of the gospel to the whole world. Jesus clearly tells his disciples that the judgment of Jerusalem will not occur before the gospel is preached throughout the whole world. But the Greek word used in this passage means the whole civilized world, the Roman Empire. And thanks to the tireless work of St. Paul, the gospel message was spread throughout the entirety of the Roman Empire in the first century. With our modern means of communication, of course, today, it is hard for us to imagine that the message of the gospel has not reached every corner of the world. What is clear and undeniable is that the signs Christ foretold leading up to the judgment of Jerusalem were fulfilled, and the devastation of the city and the destruction of the temple occurred in 70 AD at the hands of the Romans. But what is just as evident to me is that the signs of impending judgment are clearly being fulfilled once again. And they are pointing to a chastisement upon our nation. In Spain, the Blessed Mother said, You are very near the last times. The judgment of nations is near. The Creator's day is coming. I don't know how much clearer God can make it for us. Chastisement is coming. So the question for us is, what is God calling us to do in this time of spiritual and moral ruin in our culture? Well, fortunately, Christ outlined seven lessons for us before he ascended into heaven so that we would know what to do while we await his return the time when he will set all things right and make all things new. That is the subject of the talk that I will give tomorrow afternoon, so if you want to know, you'll have to come back. (laughs) But I would like to finish by saying one more thing, one more comment, if you will, on our culture. You would think that the greatest injustice of our day the issue that was most pressing for us to get solved was that two people of the same sex who love each other were not allowed to get married. And if you disagreed with that premise, well, you're a homophobic bigot. Issues like this one are never about discrimination, no matter what we are told. They have always been about subverting religious freedom. Because, as I said, if the church can be silenced, who is left to stand against injustice? Martin Luther King Jr. once said, An individual who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust and who willingly accepts the penalty of imprisonment in order to arouse the conscience of the community is in reality expressing the highest respect for the law. I suspect that this is the way we may one day be describing Cardinal George's successor, Archbishop Blaise Kupich. But I think I would be remiss in my last few minutes if I do not spend just a few moments addressing what is truly the greatest injustice in our day. If I were to make a list of injustices that are prevalent in our world, I would rank gay marriage well below domestic violence, child abuse, bullying, homelessness, hunger, poverty, etc., etc., etc. But at the top of the list, with no other issue in the same stratosphere, I would have to place abortion. The fight to make abortion unthinkable is the noblest fight. The most crucial cause in the battle for justice in our day is to stop the unthinkable. 
It's the issue that I believe my generation will most be held accountable for when we stand before God. We breathe in and we turn our heads from the television in horror and dismay when we hear about the tragic fate of somebody like little Kaylee Anthony from a few years back. We mourn the senseless killing of young students at the hand of gun-wielding maniacs in our schools. The abuse or murder of any human is a great injustice. It is clear, however, that the younger and more innocent the victim, the greater the injustice that we perceive. Who could be more helpless than a preborn child? Abortion is the crime that occurs in secret, inside the womb of a mother. It is tragic when a helpless young child is killed, when a disabled person is abused, or when a woman is overpowered and assaulted. These are all heinous and evil crimes. But the preborn child is the most helpless of all. She cannot fight off her attacker. She cannot scream out. She cannot run away. Abortion is the most accepted and, dare I say, cherished social injustice taking place today. Whenever the topic of abortion arises, the mainstream media almost universally rushes to its defense. Groups of people take to the streets to express their support for this social injustice, demanding that the abortion of children continue to be protected and enshrined in law. As Christians, we commit ourselves to God, and we realize that the national political decisions being made and our personal moral beliefs are more and more and more coming into conflict. That's where you and I, on the front lines, protecting our religious freedoms and battling injustice is so vital. Should I be compelled to accept a political philosophy that not only strives for gay equality, but also uh, strives to make others participate in these new norms despite their religious objections? Should I be forced to submit to a law that forces me to fund contraceptive coverage and abortion? Must I accept a mandate that continues to force me to send my kids to crappy public schools that often undermine my faith-based beliefs or that attacks me when I seek alternative means for my children like homeschooling? Pope St. John Paul II said that vast sectors of society are confused about what is right and what is wrong and are at the mercy of those with the power to create opinion and impose it on others. Given such a grave situation, we need now more than ever to have the courage to look the truth in the eye and to call things by their proper name, without yielding to convenient compromises or to the temptation to self-deception. In this regard, the warning of the prophet is extremely straightforward. Woe to those who call evil good, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Today we are called by Christ's resurrection to be courageous in living and sharing our faith. And as we live in response to God's call, we will often find ourselves in conflict with the culture around us, And we may even find ourselves being mocked, ridiculed, even persecuted. Our answer is not to compromise our beliefs, but it is also not to aggressively fight with those who would deny the truth. If we must suffer to stand our ground, then we suffer willingly, and we draw close to our God. Jesus' life and death on the cross showed us that it is not conflict that overcomes evil, it is self-sacrificing love. 
May you and I model that truth.